Good afternoon. Welcome to the IEEE webinar on Lockheed's reconnaissance satellites. I'm Tom Gardner, a member of the Silicon Valley Technology History Committee. Our committee sponsors these events, now webinars, several times a year to cover interesting technology developments originating in Silicon Valley. Lockheed has been in the Valley for almost 70 years. In 2016, we had a seminar on Lockheed's Polaris program, a startup in the Valley with nuclear weapons. The webinar is budgeted at two hours, 90 minutes of which will be presentations, plus 30 minutes for Q&A. But we will most likely run over the budget. We are focusing on Lockheed's Corona program. Corona is more than a beer. It's more than a virus. It's more than a typewriter, although some folks think its name came from the typewriter, but others say its name came from the cigars. In any event, on August 10, 1960, a few weeks after America orbited Drab 1, the United States launched the first successful Corona imagery intelligence satellite. Corona took pictures of denied territories and then returned the exposed film to Earth in capsules ejected from the spacecraft, which Air Force planes recovered in mid-air over the Pacific Ocean. Corona operated until 1972. Its imagery showed that U.S. intelligence had overestimated the number of Soviet missiles and other military capabilities. The United States established clearer lines of authority to manage America's growing and increasingly diffuse reconnaissance program. Dr. Joseph Cherick, Undersecretary of the Air Force and Director of the Office of Missile and Satellite Systems, and Richard Bissell, CIA Deputy Director of Plans, led the newly formed NRO. From 1961 to 1992, NRO managed America's reconnaissance program in secrecy. During this period, the NRO pioneered increasingly sophisticated collection systems as demand for satellite reconnaissance grew. KH-7 and KH-9 film return systems provided imagery of Soviet and Chinese nuclear installations, ICBM sites, and other activities in denied areas. Between the first KH-7 mission in 1963 and the end of the KH-9 program in 1986, these systems returned over 91,000 linear feet of film. But deep orbiting capsules, developing a film, and examining the images took weeks. America needed a faster method of gaining intelligence from space. On December 19, 1976, NRO launched the KH-11 Near Real-Time Electro-Optical Satellite, which transmitted data to Earth via a relay satellite instead of using film. Today, the U.S. government openly acknowledges the NRO and the variety of users depend on the enormous amount of data NRO satellites collect. NRO, from its headquarters in Chantilly, Virginia, builds, operates, and maintains a high-speed global information system of satellites and ground-based communications. Corona is just one program in 50 years of Lockheed's reconnaissance satellites. It was the first eye in the sky. We'll cover briefly other KH series satellites, Gambit, Hexagon, and Kennan. And then we'll briefly talk about Iconis, which was a commercial satellite, which more or less established the commercial geospatial agency uh, intelligence business. We have assembled here a team of six Lockheed veterans, all retired, with more than 200 years of experience at Lockheed and related companies. I'll let them introduce themselves during their presentations, but the agenda is our first presentation will be an overview of the time at the beginning of Corona and the, by Sam Araki. He'll be followed by Bill Monroe, who will dive into detail of the Corona program. And then the next four speakers, Miles Johnson, Jim Carlock, Terry Zaccone, and you, Sadly, will cover technologies and systems that were developed 
in Corona and extended into the other programs. Then Sam will return to discuss Corona's legacy and that will be followed by a question and answer series. It's now my pleasure to introduce Sam Araki. Sam, are you there? Hi, Tom. Thank you very much for the introduction. I would like to start in 1955. 1955 was the year that I graduated from Stanford with my master's and then uh, stayed on, started with the Corona program, ended my career in 1997 as the president of Lockheed Martin after the merger. So with that, I'd like to start the next chart. Uh, let's go back to 1955 when uh, the Soviet threat, uh, bombers and ICBM uh, was really in heavy development uh, by the Soviet Union. And um, President Eisenhower uh, with the CIA, with uh, Mr. Bessel, uh, really chartered the Lockheed Skunk Works, Kelly Johnson's shop, to build to develop the U-2 program. And the U-2 flew at uh, 70,000 feet altitude. Uh, there was another program called uh, WS-119L. It's a balloon reconnaissance program. Uh, it was uh, released in from Turkey, flew over the Soviet Union, and landed in the Pacific Ocean. Unfortunately, this was not a very reliable program because the balloon would drift in many different directions depending on the, the wind direction at the time. So there was only about 40% of the capsules were captured. So um, this was the state of the, of the technology and the state of reconnaissance at this time. Next chart, please. In 1956, the Rand Corporation, uh, sponsored by the Air Force, put out a Rand report, uh, basically on the new frontiers of space. And with that report, uh, General Schriever at the Missile Div Assistance Division in LA uh, issued an RFP called the Weapon System 117L. The competitors were Lockheed, uh, Glenn L. Martin, RCA, and Bell Lab. Uh, Lockheed won the program, and um, they consisted of three major program activities. One was the early warning program called MIDAS, another one called SAMOS, which was a photo reconnaissance program with uh, onboard processing of the film scanned and with a video downlink. And the third last part of the program was, was a call to discover program, which basically was flying monkeys in a capsule and returning the capsule. For many of you, uh, I'm, I'm sure you remember uh, Fritz Oder, uh, he was a colonel at that time, and he was our WS 117L program manager. Next chart, please. In 1957, uh, we had a rude awakening. Sputnik 1 was launched, followed by Sputnik 2, all in the same year. And uh, every the whole United States was in a state of shock. Uh, there were fears that uh, the Soviets would now uh, use uh, uh, fly nuclear weapons into orbit. And so, next chart, please. 
but in order to get into to uh, space, uh, uh, we had a uh, Corona challenge was was very very uh, strong in terms of having to conquer the space radiation vacuum zero gravity extreme temperatures and uh president eisenhower says i want you to i want you to accept the challenge to build build and launch corona in nine months and the way he got the nine months was because kelly johnson developed the u2 in eight months and made it operational. He says, I'm gonna give you one more extra month. Next chart, please. So, uh, President Eisenhower quickly with his two, three advisors, uh, Dr. Killian of MIT, uh, Sid Durrell, Dr. Sid Durrell, Stanford, and Dr. Edwin Land, a Polaroid. Uh, those three individuals together with the president says, boy, if we're gonna go into space fast, we've got to not only have, have a space race, but we have to have a technology race. So with Corona, he also gave the lead to MIT and Stanford to lead the space race. And as written below for the te technology race, the, the MIT activity, uh, I'm, uh, all of you are familiar with that. Stanford uh, was a Valley of Prunes at that time. And this was the entry into Silicon Valley. And uh, I wanna mention Moore's Law because in 1964, uh, Moore's Law, uh, Gordon Moore, forecasted the Moore's Law, and we rode the flywheel of the semiconductor development for the space race. And of course, Stanford also started a astronautics program because there was no courses in space until that time. There was a Eisenhower and a vessel decided that in order to succeed in Corona, that you, we need to adopt Kelly Johnson's Skunk Works operation. So what is listed there below is the tenets that we followed in terms of not only building teamwork, and this is teamwork between government and contractors and teamwork within the contractor itself, contractor community. And also heavy, heavy emphasis on moving fast and mo introducing innovation as quickly as possible. Next chart. The other thing that had to be structured was the Corona team structure. And it became complicated because the classification as you shown in the red dotted line uh, called talent keyhole as shown here is consisted of the payload that uh, consisted of uh, LMSD, Jim Plummer, heading it up, and uh, camera, film, and reentry vehicle. This was set up in a separate facility from Lockheed. In fact, it was set up at a Hiller plant on Willow Road and uh, totally covert. In fact, all of the Jim's people wore Lockheed badges. Uh, on the right is the Discover program. Uh, President Eisenhower lifted the Discover program 
from WS 117L and literally moved the entire program into Corona. The way they set the program going fast was uh, Bessel and Rentland from the Air Force side put together a meeting uh, that Jim Plummer organized at the Flamingo Hotel in San Mateo. And uh, Bissell or Bessel, Plummer, uh, Rentland, and the three con contractors, um, ITEC, Kodak, and GE were all present. And they met for three days, principally to hash out the configuration to be built and to basically prepare a statement of work and a schedule and Jim Plummer was in charge of finalizing that since he was going to be the lead contractor or the prime contractor. So at the end of three days, they had a statement of work schedule, agreed to set of dollars, and that was a kickoff meeting. Next chart, please. The resulting program that got developed uh, on the left is the uh, Thor booster with the Corona and Agena upper stage. In the middle is the satellite, Corona satellite, and also the mission control at Vandenberg uh, in Sunnyvale for STC and for recovery in Hawaii. And then on the right, is the Photo Interpretation Center in Washington, D.C. And we also uh, had a, a separate program called um, Argon, which was the Defense Mapping Agency mapping program. Next chart, please. I want to spend a little bit of time on this busy chart because Corona went through a tremendous amount of innovation in a very short time. The, the initial configuration, KH-1, with the Agena A and Thor was not only totally undersized, but very unreliable. As you can see uh, on the bottom there, one out of 10 in 5960, two out of 10 in 61, and so on. So as soon as we got some films back, we realized that uh, we, we had to go through a major upgrade to be able to meet any of the commitments that was made for the Corona program. We also realized that from the initial films, that the Soviet Union is on the cloud uh, most of the time. So if we didn't have a weather satellite uh, looking after us, we'd be taking nothing but cloud pictures. So DMSP first launch was in August of 1962. And this was an, also another NRO program start at that time and then transferred into the Air Force. The light colored section in the right is KH-4, which was a stereo camera. And also included in that series was KH-5, which is a mapping camera. And knowing that we have to get to higher resolution, there was KH-6, which was a high resolution uh, payload. Uh, but the significant thing is that we also had a roll joint that rolled the camera uh, on orbit. And all of these will, were applied in the 
program uh, to follow, which was Hexagon, both carried the ma mapping camera and stereo uh, surveillance camera. And the uh, cage, I mean, uh, uh, G uh, Gamut 3 carried the row joint. But as you can see, uh, in this very quick time period, we increased the reliability up to 70%. And with this configuration, uh, we were able to see most of the Soviet Union in terms of missile sites, airplane, uh, airports, submarine bases, and so on. So it was quite an accomplishment, uh, starting from the point of zero knowledge of space in 1959, getting the first recovery in 1960, and then getting into an operational phase that lasted until 1972. Next chart, please. Uh, I'd like to end this uh, uh, portion, my portion, by just uh, reminding all, all of you, we went from KH1 in 1959 to KH4B in the 1963 period and operated from 1959 to 1972. So with this, I'd like to introduce Bill Monroe, who will talk about the Corona system. Hi, uh, thanks very much, Sam. Uh, I appreciate that introduction. Um, I graduated from Cal in um, June of 58 and joined uh, Lockheed in uh, the next month on Polaris Modern Checkout. And then as the Air Force programs were expanding, I, uh, went, I joined the Air Force programs and moved into the Orbit Thermodynamics Organization. And I became a thermal guy for Gina D and then uh, later moved into payload testing and after a uh, total of seven and, and a half years at Lockheed, I joined iTech and became the camera thermal guy, KH4B to the remainder of the program. The work at iTech also gave me opportunities to work with both the uh, Skunk Works programs on the U2 and the SR-71 uh, folks. Um, this is a picture, this is a picture, there it is, <laughs> of the last Corona launch at Vandenberg. And as Sam said, none of this existed at the, uh, at the beginning of the program. The Thor missile had to be converted into a booster and around the base of the, of the missile, you can see the solid strap-on motors that made that possible. The Agena provided both the upper stage and the satellite, uh, the spacecraft on orbit. Up here is the Corona payload covered with a cooling blanket. I uh, have to mention the cooling blanket was also there to keep people from seeing that there were windows on that payload, um, such as the time that John Kennedy and Nikita Khrushchev rode through uh, Vandenberg on the um, uh, Southern Pacific Railroad. And um, uh, I know they tried to keep uh, Khrushchev distracted during that time. There's one other thing I wanna mention about that payload uh, blanket. And that was during the time they were trying to figure out how to get it ripped off, they had attached, um, a mock-up of that to the side of a 1956 Thunderbird and we're pulled over by the CHP at 95 miles an hour. Um, speed limit then of course was 55 on Bayshore Highway, then three lanes. Fortunately, Frank talked his way out of that one. So, but this is a program and I think the fact that there were 145 launches um, would uh, certainly qualify that as being a program. Now, once the satellite was launched from Vandenberg in a southerly direction, it would put the satellite in orbit in kind of like this on descending nodes coming over uh, Asia. I wanna mention also the, the launch vehicle had to accelerate that entire uh, payload with the help of the Agena second stage from zero to 17,000 miles per hour to keep it in orbit. So um, the orbit is, the satellites are whipping by here at 17,000. That's why you see so much fuel in a launch vehicle. These southerly passes, for example, allowed coverage over um, the Eurasian area as shown in this um, uh, little map. And um, there's coverage areas here over Russia, 
Um, here's Kazakhstan uh, in this area, the launch uh, site that they still use today for Proton. Um, there's coverages over North Korea, nothing over our friendly nation, Japan. Um, and I can say we also uh, covered Crimea and, um, and the uh, Eastern uh, Iron Curtain Bloc countries in this slide. There was a time in one of the Israeli-Egyptian uh, conflicts that um, uh, the, some of the intelligence people wanted pictures of the Cairo airport and they requested that um, uh, that of General King at Space Division if he had pictures of the airport. He said, I have great pictures. If you can move the airport about a, to a couple of hundred miles east and uh, maybe a few, you know, uh, a hundred miles south, I've got some great pictures that you could use. Uh, and as Sam mentioned, this, these pictures got better after the weather satellites allowed factoring in of the programming from the H timer of when the payload actually operated. Sam uh, Miles will talk more about that later. Uh, during the satellite on orbit, the, uh, the cameras rotated and it was a panoramic camera. The strip of film that they would take or the picture they would take was about um, 145 miles wide as, it, as the camera painted that picture onto the uh, end of the film. Uh, there was, at the end of the program, each, um, each mission would carry about almost 32,000 feet of 70 millimeter film. Uh, at the first early programs, that was about 40 pounds of film. By the end, they were carrying 160 pounds of film. Uh, the coverage was about 7 million square miles per mission. The total program coverage was 550 million square miles. And, and they um, actually, you know, whatever, we developed and, um, and inspected 2.1 million feet of film. That's about 400 miles of film totally. Uh, when it was time to re-enter, the Agena would pitch down about 120 degrees so they could pop off the re-entry body um, in counter direction to the orbit. Um, then they would pitch, as they say, pitch down, um, deploy the, the payload. It would then spin up, fire the, uh, the retro rocket, then spin down, uh, separate the thrust cone at about 500,000 feet and start separating the uh, parachutes at about, um, oh, 50, 60,000 feet and deploy the main chute at 55 to 60,000 feet. And again, we're decelerating from 17,000 miles per hour down to about 20 miles per hour in order for this airplane catch. Here's a shot of the first, um, the first catch in August, 1960. That's a C-119 uh, flying boxcar. Later, they went to the Lockheed C-130. Uh, this is an artist shot of that same um, uh, event of the airplane catching the bucket. Um, it allows me to first show, well, from a pilot perspective, it maybe is not so easy to actually find the, um, uh, to find out where the, where the parachute is. But it also allows me to recall that uh, a month earlier than this, in July of 1960, Lockheed and the Navy had demonstrated the first undersea Polaris submarine Pol um, Polaris launch in, uh, in the other ocean. Uh, and also to point out that in the summer of um, 1960 or in the fall after this film was developed, there was a pres another presidential campaign going on that year. It was between Dick Nixon and John Kennedy. And there had been talk of missile gap and so forth. And that uh, talk really diminished to a murmur after both um, Nixon and uh, Kennedy had been briefed about uh, what was found. So um, the next uh shot just a moment i just have to get myself back over here um <clears throat> excuse me it went the wrong direction for just a minute I, those are the the corona paths launch photograph recovery 
but it's not the beginning or the end of the story. So I want to talk about several other paths, some of which are redundant uh, to Sam's, and I'll, uh, I'll, I won't dwell on those. Um, so I want to talk about the program organization and the kernels. I want to talk a little bit more about Lockheed's story and their people and expertise, uh, and then jump over and talk about where GE and ITech and Eastman Kodak came from. I want to talk about the film paths, the ground station paths, and the accomplishments and the legacy of the program. So the, this is the same organization that Sam showed, um, but it did come out of a classified document. Uh, and so that's the reason for the, um, uh, the cross outs. It was declassified and this was presented in the 1995 declassification ceremonies at, um, in Washington, DC. So up in the upper left is Dick Bissell that uh, Sam talked about. And on the right is the other guy with Ritlin, which was Colonel Battle, who was running the, uh, at the time, the Air Force, Los Angeles Air Force Station was called Air Force Ballistic Missile Division. And that's Colonel Battle up there. Uh, and so the right-hand side, Colonel Battle was responsible for the, um, the launch vehicle. He was responsible for the Discover program. Now this Lockheed in the middle here had arrived in um, Stanford Industrial Park uh, about 1957 or 58 on Hanover Street uh, on the other side of Hewlett Packard from Page Mill Road up the hill from Berrien. And, uh, but shortly moved their uh, major activities to Sunnyvale um, between Moffett Field and Matilda Avenue for the most part, just off Bayshore Highway. And the launch tracking and recovery support was also under the auspices of Colonel Battle, and we'll talk more about those later. So this is the white side of the organization over here on the right, so right is white. On the left side was the black part of it. And you'll find that Jim Plummer sat in both boxes. He was the advanced uh, programs section over here. And under this work uh, is where the, um, uh, the, all the payload systems and structures and flight support, the iTech camera, the, the reentry body, and, um, uh, and so forth. So here's what these three guys said about the program. Dick Bissell said, almost all the people on the government side were more interested in getting the job done than in claiming credit or gaining control. Colonel Battle, the program was its own reward. It was damned exciting, the highlight of my life. And Jim Plummer very modestly said, <laughs> diverted the attention. The real work was done by the shop people, the technicians, the design engineers. No single individual created the program. Industry worked with government. It was clearly a team effort. So here was the kind of the arrangement of, of Lockheed in the, uh, in the early days. Uh, there were program offices including the uh, Discover program, system engineering, some very strong subsystem people, airframe, propulsion, electrical, guidance, controls, dynamics. This is where some of your uh, uh, Jim and Terry are gonna be speaking from the standpoint of that organization. There's telemetry tracking and command subsystem H. The R&D support came um, also to provide the structural analysts and the thermal folks. Hugh is going to be speaking about thermodynamics, uh, reliability and others, integration and test and Vandenberg launch base. Um, and these are a very strong functional organization. Uh, these people could also be referred to as managing silos. So um, here's a little bit of hardware picture. The, um, the Bell aircraft provided the rocket engine. It was actually developed for a B-58 Hustler program as a rocket assisted takeoff. But the pro that aircraft program was canceled, but the Air Force people knew about that and rescued it for Agena. So it was matching both the capabilities of the Thor and the capabilities of the Agena with that rocket engine that, um, that came together as a system. The rocket fuels, I love to say this, unsymmetrical dimethyl hydrazine, UDMH, and inhibited red fuming nitric acid. Not, these are not exactly household chemicals. Uh, these were also fired at, in, um, uh, test fired 
at the Santa Cruz test base, uh, which I understand just recently lost some buildings in the, uh, in the recent Santa Cruz mountain fire. Uh, in subsystem D also, this was a computer in 1960, 1959, 60. It was called a subsystem D timer or the sequence computer. It was also called the ascent timer. As you can see those little wheels in there that look like the odometer in your car. Yeah, that was the way it was programmed. And uh, your next speaker, Miles Johnson, assured me that he had actually twisted those um, cogs around to set the timer for ascent events on Agena when he first worked at the, uh, at the test base. The, um, the payload timer that I mentioned, the H timer, was much more sophisticated. It actually was programmed using a punched tape. It was a Mylar tape, but kind of like a paper tape that was punched and, uh, and ran through to uh, provide the programming. So here's an Agena D in integration. Uh, technicians here on the right are partially obscuring the forward equipment rack. The payload attached on the right-hand side of this picture. Um, you'll also hear from, um, uh, well, when Terry speaks, I can tell you the horizon sensor is right in front of his coat pocket down here in the lower part. Here's the, um, the nested propellant tanks. And on the left is the uh, aft rack showing the, again, this uncooled rocket nozzle extension. The propulsion people were so happy to say it was, it was radiation cooled. Um, the spacecraft people over here referred to it as that damn red hot heat source. Uh, also, you can see two bottles here of cold gas, which were used for the attitude control thrusters. Uh, sticking out um, uh, also in the aft rack. So the other side of the program, the black side occurred uh, on Willow Road. Uh, and this is the um, kind of like almost the last building before the traffic light, before the railroad tracks on your way out to Facebook. Uh, it was called Advanced Programs of Hiller Helicopter. And in this building and the buildings behind it were managers and engineers from Lockheed, customers from the agency and the Air Force. Uh, structures and electronics came from Lockheed. The cameras arrived from iTech, film from Eastman Kodak, the reentry systems from General Electric, techs from Hiller Helicopter. And here was performed all of the integration and test and actually creation of some of the other devices needed for film handling. Um, and then the, the payload was finally just transported in a box truck, a Hertz truck, to Vandenberg uh, for launch. So the uh, payload arrangement is probably better described by a line drawing like this than a, an actual photograph. At the very top of this stack, you see the, um, the two reentry bodies uh, containing the, um, the main take up cassettes. Uh, there's a little rocket there at the bottom of the, of the first vehicle one. Here's vehicle two below it. Uh, behind that, you'll have the cameras. I'll have a picture of those coming up later. But they're in a st uh, stereo arrangement in KH-4B. Um, and then behind is the film cassette, which uh, has one uh, film going to each camera and then both of those films going into the, um, the exposed film going into the reentry buckets. There's an intermediate roller assembly and a film cutter. When the first um, bucket was uh, released, then the film had to be cut and spliced to go into the second bucket. There's also the um, stellar index camera and a terrain camera to help the photo interpreters uh, figure out what they're looking at. <clears throat> So General Electric provided the reentry bodies. That was uh, an organization on Chestnut Street in Philadelphia. They were awarded that contract based on their ablative uh, heat shield work and uh, with a number of subsystems um, within. So, you know, each contractor had their own subsystems, but they had the film take up spools, the coal gas spin up system, the solid propellant retro rocket the ablative heat shield and the drogue in the main uh, parachutes. And so the, um, the bucket uh, with the film spools is over here. You can see a couple of spools inside the bucket. Here's the heat shield in the left-hand picture with the bucket below uh, bit, the parachute stack, 
and up here the retro rockets and the and the gas spin up system. Initially, that spin up system didn't work real well uh, because they had two rocket motors that didn't seem to start at the same time, and it and the uh, the system wobbled on reentry. They were replaced with a uh, a coal gas spin up system called Lifeboat that was uh, developed on uh, on Willow Road, as I recall. So um, iTech Corporation built the cameras. They were iTech came out of Boston University's physical research lab, purchased for 100K in late 57. Now that Boston University actually built the cameras that floated in those balloons that Sam talked about earlier. The um, panoramic camera proposed for the search mission was a larger, uh, twice the focal length of the, of the cameras uh, mentioned above and it necessitated a three axis of genus system. When the program first began, they didn't know whether they needed a three axis stabilized uh, spacecraft to hold a camera or whether the whole thing would spin. Um, and it was probably a good thing that they didn't select the Fairchild design because it probably would have rotated end over end instead of um, around its belly button. And those were the meetings at the Flamingo Hotel in March of 58 that Sam referred to. So the ITEX Generation 2 design uh, featured a 24 inch focal length F35 Petzval. That's kind of a, a um, uh, oh gosh, a, a, a lens for taking um, uh, pictures of people, but, um, but it was well adapted for this uh, use. What we were doing with this camera, say you're 100, 110 miles away on terrestrial terms, um, with our camera in California, say, would be in Sacramento, and we would be photographing goings on at Moffett Field near the Google headquarters with about a four to five foot resolution. Uh, for you guys on the East Coast, that's about the same distance as from Philadelphia to Baltimore. So here's um, a couple of pictures the right hand picture shows the uh, size of the lens in conjunction with a um, uh, state-of-the-art at the time 35 millimeter camera. On the left, these lenses, one each resided within these large drums and constantly rotated and uh, counter-rotated as it were. And the film was held in a platen that was uh, above the drum in this case. And when the camera was looking out the bottom, the field flattener would go across this, um, this arc and that's where the film was captured. And then the film had to be pulled out at something in the order of 18 inches per second in order to uh, be in position for the next uh, rotation of the lens. So let me say a few words about the film paths. <clears throat> uh, the film came from, uh, as we heard from Eastman Kodak, and they had to invent and coat polyester-based 70 millimeter film. They, there was an attempt to use the original acetate film that many of us have seen burn up in movie theaters um, and couldn't stand the acceleration, deceleration, nor the lack of, um, uh, of moisture to keep it from breaking. So polyester film was necessary. Aerial film is a very slow film um, ASA two to five. Um, so it, it's very slow, but very fine grain. Uh, where performance of the cameras was on the order of 170 lines per millimeter. You could resolve 170 lines in each millimeter of width. That was the performance. So that film, as we showed, traveled from spools through cameras and into the buckets. And after exposure, there was the air catch. And then the film went to Hickam in Hawaii. It was flown to Moffat and then to Lockheed where it was de-spooled. It was sent back to Moffat and then to the East Coast, um, mainly to Westover Air Force Base for developing and duplicating. And then the film went to NPIC uh, at the Washington DC Navy Yard and to Defense Mapping Agency in St. Louis. After the program was declassified in 1995, the film was sent to the Earth Resources Observation and Science Center, that's EROS in Sioux Falls, South Dakota, for ongoing environmental and 
archaeological studies. Now that that film added 12 years of knowledge of what was going on on the earth, even though it wasn't full coverage, it was per certainly provided uh, a lot of data of what's happened in early times. And it's very beneficial that it did uh, wind up in a good place. Uh, I wanna talk about the ground stations path. Uh, Lockheed built and outfitted the satellite test center, the blue cube predecessor, and um, I understand that they sold that land to the Air Force for $1. It's certainly more valuable now, or has been shown to be more valuable. So Philco Corporation out of Philadelphia formed their Western Development Laboratories, WDL, moved west and built the six initial tracking stations, Cook, Cody, Hula, Boss, Thule, and Indy. That, Cook was at Vandenberg, which was its earlier name. Cody, Alaska. Huli was, of course, Hawaii. Boss was um, actually in New Hampshire, but it was the Boston station. Thule, Greenland, and Indy was Diego Garcia in the Indian Ocean. Uh, Philco later morphed into Philco Ford, Ford Aerospace, Laurel Space and Com, and has another name now, Maxar. The uh, space and range divisions that came out of Philco uh, and the SATCOM terminals divisions became part of Lockheed Martin in the 90s. So here's just a few um, tidbits of, of what the results look like. This is a, uh, a missile site for a medium range or uh, intermediate range missile that was uh, taken in, uh, in Russia. And photo like this allowed us when we saw, when we saw this was happening in Cuba, there were a follow-up um, U-2 mission to take photos that actually could be shown to the public because there was no way that Eisenhower uh, was, I'm sorry, Kennedy was going to release um, the information that we were actually able to do this from space. These slides were, um, you, you don't expect that you're gonna see much detail in these, they were actually um, copies of handouts from the 1995 declassification ceremonies. This is a, a long range airfield. Uh, the photo interpreters uh, saw two regiments of Tupolev Bear bombers on a 13,000 foot runway. And here is um, a picture of downtown Moscow in May of 1970. The photo, again, the photo interpreters identified a line of visitors waiting to uh, visit Lenin's tomb. Um, this is a uh, the Serov, S Severodonsk uh, shipyard where we watched the Soviets build their nuclear and diesel powered submarines. And uh, this is a uh, an icebreaker path where they were um, trying to break out some newly developed uh, or newly completed uh, submarines out. This shipyard is on the White Sea, which is way up around the corner from the top of Norway and, and um, Sweden. So uh, it's rather, uh, what am I gonna say, pr uh, protected area from uh, people watching except by satellite. Uh, this is a later image of Central Park in 1968. It's an example of later image exploitation. This one came from the U.S. Geological Survey uh, by way of Gatto images. Um, these uh, three bar targets in the Arizona desert have created a, a fair amount of speculation. These are standard U.S. Air Force three bar targets and they're used for calibration of the uh, orbital cameras in uh, lines per millimeter. Uh, but certainly they created speculation for uh, pilots and hikers and, um, you know, talk of alien landing strips and so forth. But, um, but that was the way the performance was, was ensured. So these program intelligence accomplishments again came out of the, uh, were listed at the declassification ceremony. So this is official CIA released information. So the program imaged all the Soviet medium range, intermediate range and ICBM complexes, imaged each submarine class from deployment to bases, 
uh, provided inventories of Soviet bombers and fighters, um, found the Soviet missiles in Egypt, uh, identified Soviet nuclear assistance to the People's Republic of China, uh, as I mentioned, provided indication of the MRBM site in uh, Cuba. And the program also was, was key in monitoring the uh, uh, strategic arms limitation talks compliance. Again, page two uncovered Soviet anti-ballistic missile uh, sites, identified atomic weapon and storage installations, uh, locations of Soviet air defense batteries, uh, watched their Soviet ocean fleet, uh, and provided um, uh, mapping for the strategic air command targeting and bomber routes. Uh, in 2005, 10 years after the declassification ceremonies, the program was awarded the Charles Stark Draper Prize. This is awarded by the National Academy of Science, Engineering, and Medicine for the design, develop, and operation of Corona, the first space-based Earth observation system. And in particular, they named five individuals, the Lockheed Program Manager, Jim Plummer, the Lockheed Lead Engineer, Sam Araki, who you just heard from, the ITEC Optical Systems Program Manager, uh, Frank Madden, who was a real gentleman, and he was very clever with finding solutions to all kinds of problems, and he was my boss uh, on the program when I was at ITEC. And then the Kodak guy, Don Schosler, and the GE Recovery Vehicle um, uh, Manager, Ed Miller. So finally, some historical context I want to share with you. Uh, when John Kennedy announced the Man on the Moon program in 1961, all of the basic necessary technologies had been demonstrated by Corona and they were all known to him. Rockets, launch vehicles, spacecraft, trajectories, reentry, recovery, and man rating was the biggest challenge that was left for NASA. Uh, GPS uh, satellite contracts had not yet been awarded. There had been work done on the atomic clock, which was essential to that technology, but no satellite contracts had been awarded until at least the year after this program finished. Um, NASA's Landsat was launched in 1972, again, uh, just after completion of Corona. And, um, uh, and I already mentioned the use of the uh, environmental data coming from the from the leftover, as it were, leftover film. And then finally, the uh, HP calculator that everyone has embedded in their smartphone now had, was only introduced, again, 72, and we certainly could have used that earlier. Oops, I did it. So I'd like to summarize by saying that I, I want to give these words from Dr. Jack Rodden, who was a Lockheed Guidance and Control Managers. He summed up the program. He said, it worked real good. So now I want to introduce uh, my good friend and, and colleague, Miles Johnson. Miles, take it away. Thank you, Bill. And uh, thank you, Sam. And thanks again also for the charts that I'm going to borrow from you each of you to use in my presentation. My name is Miles Johnson, and I'm gonna to speak to you on the subject of Corona Program Engineering. And as a side to those who, I've, who are watching at my invitation, I've waited 60 years to tell this story. First of all, let's talk about my background. My background, I started in, I finished gradu the graduation from Ohio State University in 1961 and joined Lockheed and remained with Lockheed from 1962 to 1984, a period of 32 years. So I'm a 32 year veteran of Lockheed. Of those 32 years, I've been worked in reconnaissance programs of which I'll be speaking for a period of 30 years. And of the 30 years on reconnaissance programs, eight of those were spent with the Corona program. Next chart. The Corona program, which was reviewed both by Sam and, and also Bill. I'm gonna reshow here for the purposes of, of proceeding with my presentation. Starting at the 12 o'clock position, you can see the Corona Agena satellite 
consisting of the reentry vehicle by GE, the camera by ITEC, film by Kodak, and the payload and the Gina by the Lockheed Missile and Space Division. In order to achieve orbit, of course, you needed the launch vehicle on the left, shown as the Thor booster produced by Douglas and the Corona Gina tested and integrated by Lockheed Missile and Space Division. The five elements, therefore, consist of the boost, the Corona Gina satellite, both of which consist of the portion of the Corona program. In order to control the Corona satellite on orbit, you need ground systems, which are shown at the six o'clock position. The ground systems are used both for the launch of the vehicle as well as the command and control of the satellite on orbit. The ground systems are also used during the recovery process, whereby the Air Force airplane snatches the satellite, the uh, recovery vehicle, at, as Bill Monroe described. Once the film has been recovered, it's sent to Washington, D.C. for photographic analysis, as shown in the four o'clock position. Next chart, please. The three charts that I'm going to show in sequence describe the corona mission as it exists. The first being, of course, that you need to achieve orbit. This is done in this particular slide by the diagram indicating the Thor boost phase, followed by the upper stage Agena burn. The Agena, in the meantime, or as Bill Monroe described, is set is is controlled by the ascent timer, which I as during a my period of being a guidance and control engineer at Vandenberg Air Force Base actually set using my hands. So I know a little bit about that. Following orbit injection, the Corona satellite is, is three axis stable and performs its mission of photo, photographic intelligence as has been described by Sam and by Bill. During the operation on orbit, the Agena has what is referred to by Bill as an H timer. And that H timer is pre-programmed to turn the camera on and off at, at the period where you're over land masses of interest. Next chart, please. This chart was shown by Bill and I have a little different slant. First of all, you understand in panel left you are seeing the Earth with its oceans and landmass, and you see the green lines, which represents the orbits of the of the Corona mission. It so understand the physics here. You we have a satellite that's going around the Earth at 90, 90 minute periods. It's in a polar orbit. It has perigee of 100 nautical miles and apogee of 200 nautical miles. It's sun synchronous, and it's traveling at a revolution every 90 minutes. In the meantime, the Earth underneath it is traveling at 25,000 nautical or miles per hour, one revolution per day. So the context of those two dynamics is then shown in panel on the right, where you're seeing the swath widths of the photo over landmass of interest. And here becomes the, the integration of the ground system with regard to the on-orbiting vehicle, and that is that the ground system is being fed information from around the world concerning cloud cover, weather, and anything of interest that may affect, the, that may be of interest with regard to the imaging of the Corona satellite. Therefore, the ground system overrides the commands that are on board that are turning, that are to turn on the camera. And therefore, the camera can be programmed to only be operating for film conservation purposes at the times when it's necessary. Next slide, please. Once you've reached a point where, as a matter of interest, the used film need be recovered, either due to the, re the fact that you've used all the film or you have reached a point where you must sample what is contained on the existing film, the recovery sequence is, is commanded by ground stations. And it's shown here and has been previously described by Bill. The Agena 
payload, Corona Gene, a payload combination is commanded to pitch down and I show a 120 degree maneuver following the ejection of the GE recovery vehicle. It, and it reaches parachute deployment. It reaches a point where by an Air Force flying boxcar then snatches it, takes it back to Washington, DC and the film is therefore uh, photographic interpreted. Next slide, please. I want to spend a little time on this because I was part of this uh, in the sense of the fact of being at Vandenberg Air Force Base during the early per point period of my career. And understanding re and uh, repeating the program concept of Corona was to use a modified standard of gene as a spacecraft bus, add a camera imaging, recoverable film payload, and launch the entire composite booster Corona and Agena from Vandenberg Air Force Base. So that was the concept. I asked, I, I then indicate that the challenges were the lack, as Sam pointed out, the lack of understanding of launch and on-arm environments. I will testify to the absence of system requirements and verification. The differences between security and classification between the various components of the Corona program were vast, ranging from unclassified to top secret special handling. And this caused any amount of, of problems because of the lack or the inability to communicate. And finally, the siloed engineering and test organizations, which I'll de demonstrate in the next slide, please. This, this slide was shown by Bill Monroe, and I'll talk to it again because of the fact of the, my knowledge of the impacts that it created. In the early 1960s, in the early 1960s, Lockheed had a complete array of all that was necessary and it, it needed to do the job. And it was shown here. There were program offices, including budgets and schedules and management. There was system engineering, which was the new, new kid on the block. And I'll be talking a little bit about that later. There were the individual subsystems that were contained within the company's engineering department that would, with regard to spacecrafts consisting of airframe, propulsion, electrical, guidance and control and tracking, which I started out at Vandenberg Air Force Base and tracking telemetry and command. These were all supported by R&D support, including structured strength and structured <laughs> dynamic analysis, ascent normal dynamics and reliability. And then you come to the the organizations involving integration and test and also the Vandenberg launch base operation, which is where I started my career. Each one of those had to do their job. And the, 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 fat, the function and problem was that each of these organizations, be they program offices or engineering or test or launch base were siloed in the sense of the fact that they had their job to do, but their job didn't necessarily involve communication or, or or relationships with any of the other organizational components. Next please. The lessons we learned, uh, the lessons we learned are as indicated here, and I was very much a part of this. This is where the new kid on the block was started. And that is the Lockheed established the systems engineering office. Its purpose was to cross all technical disciplines ensure program compatibility and function from cradle to grave. They developed an environmental analysis tools. They flowed the requirements down from mission to design to build the integration test launch and operations, including environmental tests and including system level testing. And also by analysis, they sought to avoid single point failures, but they provided and, and they provided a backup recovery capability for film for film recovery in the event that the primary system failed. But the, the jewel of all was the integrated factory to pad launch process, which I'm gonna talk about next. Next chart, please. So Corona program engineering and the flow, which was formally adopted by the Corona program and passed on to subsequent, subsequent reconnaissance programs that Lockheed was responsible for as shown in this chart. It follows on the left where it says system de definition, which includes concept of operations, requirement and architecture, detailed design, 
flowing into manufacture, assembly, and implementation. On the right, as you ascend, it consisted of every associate contractor, and that includes GE, ITEC, Kodak, and Lockheed itself, was responsible for their test and validation. And once that was done with their individual items, their individual elements, that flowed into what was termed the factory system integration. Following factory system integration, the flow was to Vandenberg. Following Vandenberg was launch readiness, launch and then mission operations. And that became the formal system engineering flow that was then passed on to each individual program. Next chart, please. This is what I refer to as the centerpiece of system engineering and it's the factory to pad process. It starts on the left vertically by enunciating the con contractors we've always talked about in the past. There's General Electric responsible for the recovery system. There's iTech responsible for the cameras. There's Kodak responsible for the film. And then there's two parts that Lockheed was responsible for. There was the payload element, which is shown by the arrow. And there was the standard Agena. Each one of those components, and then below, of course, was a Douglas booster. Now, as you flow from left to right, the next set of blocks is integration. And what needed to be done was to integrate the payload com components. And that was done at the, at the factory that we has been indicated to be on Willow Road and have a Hiller cover story attached to it. And that was where everything took place that regarded the Agena element excuse me, the payload element that's shown here. So the consequence is the GE recovery system, iTech cameras, and Kodak film was integrated into the Corona payload assembly at the factory on Willow Road. Meanwhile, at Sunnyvale, the standard Agena that was shown on the left is modified to be a program Agena. So the integration is now complete and we're ready for systems test. On system test, we move to the next block. And once again, I indicate, I have to stress the fact that there are two elements here and two different factories, none of which are talking to each other, by the way, because of the fact of security differences. The upper part, the payload element is totally tested at the factory on Willow Road the Agena, Corona Agena is tested completely at the factory in Sunnyvale. And this is where a personal story comes in that I'm personally involved in. It, it seemed to me that since neither one of the systems were going to be tested with each other, that it was necessary to have a simulator at least as something that at least would test out the interfaces. So the consequence is I made a proposal to the Air Force that then shared it with the CIA that said, let's develop interfaces. So we built a simulators for each one of the devices. For the Agena, we built a payload simulator that replicated, but of course it wasn't a camera, it wasn't a film, it was an electrical simulation that then attached itself to the front of the Agena for its system test. And we built a, we built an Agena simulator for the payload element and that did the very same thing. Following factory test and the compliance with the specifications required, every, each element was then shipped or transported to Vandenberg Air Force Base, which is shown below the dotted line where the Vandenberg testing took place. The first thing that took place was a re, retest of everything that was done in Sunnyvale as shown in, in the, first, uh, the first caricature. The second was both parts were then transported to the launch, launch pad where for the very first time they were mated. When the, and the ellipse therefore shows the very first time that the real payload and the Agena first saw each other and that system test was complete. And when complete, the composite was then combined with a Thor, a system test was performed there, launch readiness was performed, and the final act was the launch itself. So in summary, the Corona program to pad process, while 
while looking com complicated, actually was even more so because it was the it was the final, it was the method by which system engineering then took control of what was to be done because no act could be performed with could other than what was in the script without system engineering approval. Next chart, please. The evolution of Lockheed space photo reconnaissance programs is, is, was shown by, was suggested by, uh, by Tom Gardner, was covered by Sam, and I believe, I'm not sure that, uh, I'm not sure that Bill mentioned it, but this is, the, is a summary of what I very strongly will indicate is a story of success. Uh, at the top, we've talked about the Corona Agena program, a program of 14 years duration. And I refer to it as a program where to see it, meaning we were to see something and whatever we desired by camera on the on the on the ground. The Gambit program provide high high resolution, and the Hexagon program, which is a film system, as was Gambit and Corona, uh, provided multiple buckets and uh, and extended duration. So they were a see it all type system, followed by Canon, which is a non film system which was see it now, meaning uh, they, they could see it at, with, without the need to wait for film recovery. On the, on the left, you'll see five bullets consisting of people, technology, tools, process, and operation. I would like to talk about the evolution as pertaining those items. And I'm gonna choose the people first because I can talk not only about people, but I'm gonna use myself as an example. I started in the Corona pro program in 1962, as I said, after graduating from Ohio State University, and I remained on it till 1971, a period or 70, a period of, of eight years. During that eight years, I advanced from guidance and control engineering to be responsible for the test and launch of a Corona satellite at Vandenberg Air Force Base. As I indicated, I was responsible for six launches. I then migrated up to the Sunnyvale factory and worked in the system engineering office and assumed responsibility for the integration and efficacy between the Agena and the Corona payload. Following that, I left the program in 1971 and migrated down to the Kennan program, which is shown in the last box. And I was part of the Kennan proposal. And once we were selected as the winner for Kennan, I worked, I, would de I assumed the role of the manager for system integration. I became the system engineer and eventually advanced to be program manager of Kennan before, before moving on to becoming vice president of space systems vision engineering responsible for 3000 employees. But the fact is that using me as a typical example, I could replicate myself 150 times with three people like me who proceeded to take the lessons learned in our technology and our strengths and migrate through the various programs to make them as good, if not better than Corona. Technology and tools and processes did the same thing. Operations were very similar in the sense of the fact that, uh, that with regard to the matter of evolution, innovation, development, and lessons learned, we took advantage of every opportunity to become better. Next chart, please. The Corona satellite was a gateway, the Corona program was a gateway program. Lockheed Missile and Space Division System Engineering Genesis was developed on it and migrated to other programs. I give you the report card as our measure of success where we had 120 successes out of 140 attempts. I say that's a job well done. So that's my story. And after 60 years, I've now publicly told it. 
I'd like to introduce Jim Carlock, who will speak to you on Agena control systems. Thank you, Miles. Um, I came to Lockheed in 1967 as a freshly minted electrical engineer from Tennessee. Uh, proceeded to go part time to Stanford to catch up a little bit with uh, some of my colleagues here. I wanted to work control systems and I found the perfect, perfect home here in the guidance and control group in the space system division. Uh, when I got there, the uh, basic Agena had been designed. So I'll go through some of the uh, original logic that went into designing the control systems and then uh, go into a little bit more about what happened uh, as, as the Agena progressed and what happened after Agena. So next chart. I think um, it had been mentioned before that uh, the, uh, uh, to do the Corona mission, we really had two, two missions to accomplish. One was to be a second stage booster uh, because the original launch vehicle didn't have enough energy to get us on orbit and, and enough uh, forward velocity to achieve orbit. The second thing was when we got on orbit, we needed to serve as a stable platform for the camera system. Now they wisely decided to put those two functions together. We end up with a very robust system. And from an attitude control point of view, a lot of the components can be common between the two. For example, the same gyro package uh, was used for both. Everything in this, this day and age was all analog. Uh, we didn't get into digital at all until around 1970. The original Agena decision was, another good decision was made was to make it three axis stabilized. In other words, know at all times what, where the three axes uh, you see are pointed. Uh, the camera basic uh, line of sight is along what I call the Z axis. And so we wanted to keep that pointed toward uh, the vertical. Now we also wanted to control the rotation about that or the yaw so that we'd know where the X axis was pointing for firing the engine and, and other reasons. So the decision to make this three axis stabilized as opposed to a spinner, uh, the predecessors were either like the Sputnik which was kind of an uncontrolled ball in space or a spinning satellite where they would only control the antenna bore site. Uh, so anyway, we had to develop this thing that had to work during engine burn and during the coast phase. Now talk about just attitude control, the guidance and navigation functions were done on the ground. Uh, so it was pre-programmed the first engine burn. Once we'd achieved orbit, you're in a re relatively stable situation. So the ground can use tracking radar and uh, the Doppler from the communication system to do the navigation. And of course they would be solving the guidance problems to decide when to burn the engine again. So I'll just be talking about a Gina attitude control. This was something that hadn't been done before. And so there was a lot of uh, question, would it work? Uh, we used to make this work, we used gyros as the sensing element to sense rates about the three axes. We had three gyros. We would then process those signals to either gimbal the engine during the engine burn or fire small uh, cold gas thrusters during the coast phase. Now, the system would be very stable with just the, uh, uh, just the gyros and it's a fairly high bandwidth system. The problem with gyros is they drift with time. So we needed a absolute reference uh, to make this thing work. And what was chosen since we're looking down at the earth taking pictures, we'll use a earth-based horizon sensor uh, to provide uh, an error signal that tells us when the camera axis is not pointed vertical and then we can make a correction. Uh, the next speaker will talk more about how that horizon sensor worked. Now the horizon sensor gives us a good absolute reference for pointing the camera axis, but it doesn't give us any information about rotation about the camera axis or what I call yaw. Uh, there they uh, push the state of the art again and look at the fact you're in orbit. When you're going in orbit, you're constantly pitching over, uh, rotating about the y-axis there. And when you're rotating about 
one axis, that makes the errors in the other two axes couple. You just have to go through the math to prove that. So by taking advantage of that uh, rotating coordinate system effect and the fact that you measure two of the axes, you can derive an absolute reference for yaw. Another, another thing that uh, made people wonder, was that going to work? But it did. Uh, not only do you have to develop the attitude control system, uh, that's a little bit unique among the systems. You can't really check it out on the ground. You can't hang it by a sky hook and see how well it performs. So the uh, basic process was to develop models for all the pieces and, and then put the models together with, uh, with the tools that we had for analysis and simulation. So starting in the 1960s, we really didn't have very good tools and models. So all that had to be developed in parallel with doing the design work. Talk a little bit more about the, that in a moment. Of course, the other thing that they had to do as a first time was develop understanding of the space environment. You know, some of the others had mentioned radiation and thermal and so on. We had some unique environmental challenges here with the attitude control system. So I mentioned the uh, uh, rotating coordinate system. We had the orbit mechanics. We also had disturbance torques uh, that we had to worry about. We had to make sure we had enough control authority that none of these uh, torques would disturb us and we and lose control. We had the aerodynamic drag, we had gravity gradient torques, uh, magnetic torques, and so forth. As it turned out, those were relatively small and there wasn't any uh, control authority problem. Although over a longer mission, uh, they could integrate out and use up a lot of control gas. The early missions were only a few days, so that really wasn't an issue either. So with that, I'll go to the next chart. Uh, this is just an exploded view of the whole system. You can, you can see the, uh, the gyro package here feeding into the electronics box along with the horizon sensors. There's two of the horizon sensors. The next speaker will go through that. This then drives either the hydraulics to swivel the engine or uh, drives gas jets. Uh, being fed from a pressurized gas bottle. All of these electronics were put together in what was called a guidance module. And the guidance module fit in one bay of the front of the Agena, so for sizing. And remember, the Agena is about five feet in diameter, just to give you an idea. So uh, next chart, please. Uh, this is just a block diagram of, of uh, the signal flow, if you will. Uh, the gyros sensing the angular rate, there was a pre-programmed pitch rate to nominally make you pitch over at the, at the orbital rate. The horizon sensors were measuring deviation from nadir or deviations from the vertical. Then went through, everything is analog here, uh, analog estimator and then the control systems uh, to drive the actuators. All the uh, control systems transfer functions, everything was implemented in analog. These were operational amplifiers with resistor and capacitor networks. So the key requirements, we had to be stable with margin and had to demonstrate that to ourselves and our customers. We had, uh, for the optical mission, specified pointing accuracy. And it depends on the mission, uh, down to tenths of degrees toward the end. We had specified pointing stability, especially for the optical mission. If you got unwanted uh, rates about any of the axes, you're going to affect the picture, what we fondly call smear. So we had one mission that had a very wimpy payload that we had a fourth requirement that says, don't break the payload when you start the engine. So that, that was a large simulation effort. Next chart. Uh, I'll not go through the two timers that uh, control the initial events uh, since those have already been talked about. Another piece of the control system that wasn't shown in the diagram was a backup control system. Uh, this is for the optical missions, uh, either called Lifeboat or BRAC, depending on the program. But it's a totally independent control system, simple, that would just, in case the main system failed, it, it could come on and it would uh, align the Agena along the Earth's magnetic field. So you have a known attitude to eject the, the film bucket. 
we used the magnetometer uh, for a pointing reference that would align the nose of the agena to the magnetic field and then, then do maneuvers from there. There's a completely independent set of, of gas thrusters that went along with this. Uh, next chart, please. The analysis and simulation tools, I think I mentioned, you start off with all they really had was the slide rule, pencil, paper, a spiral for initial sizing. We had an analog computer for modeling for linear systems. And that got a lot of use in the early days. And even after I got there, we were still using that in 67 and probably for another 10 or 12 years after that, till digital computers caught up getting fast enough. They, they developed homegrown digital computer tools to be used uh, for these analyses. Everything was done in Fortran. There wasn't anything commercially available at the time. We had a, uh, these were developed a numerical integration simulation, a general stability analysis program for solving large system of differential equations and also a time domain solution. The typical simulation would be on the order of uh, 20 to 40 uh, order differential equation that we'd have to go through depending on how many dynamic modes we had. Next chart, please. For some of you old timers, this is just uh, some of the things that you don't see around anymore. When I got there in 1967, the Frieden calculator uh, was out in about a year. Uh, the spiral was pretty much out by the time I got there. I think only two of us still had spirals in the department. We had a much larger analog computer than this one. And in fact, we had two of them uh, in another building. And uh, those were used until the late seventies. I think now about the only place you can find one of these, there is one in the computer lab in Mountain View. So those of you who go up there, you'll get to see an analog computer real time. Next chart. Uh, again, I mentioned we had to get models for all the various pieces. The other thing that had to be modeled was once, especially during engine burn, you're interacting with the flexible body dynamics. The, uh, the Agena and its structure is not perfectly rigid. So we, we had to work closely with the dynamics guys to get models to couple in with our control system model. Same way with fuel slosh. We've got two tanks with fuel that can slosh around. And especially during engine burn, that gets, has to be coupled in to uh, ensure that we got stable systems. And of course, we had to get the gyro and the horizon sensor models and also the differential equations representing the control uh, system. Next chart. Um, the original control system worked great and served a lot of missions, as Sam mentioned, I think. The original mission, the Corona, was a wide area search mission. And uh, depending on the particular mission, I'll use a number like two meters as a resolution. Uh, but the control system was continuously improving, primarily with the uh, improvements in the gyros and the horizon sensors and a little bit of change in the uh, control systems. From a control system point of view, we had two uh, that were the uh, crowning achievements there. On the Agena, it was the gambit system because that was a high resolution point target thing. The uh, Corona and Hexagon basically mapped everything that was beneath the uh, uh, orbit track, or at least it could. During that, once they got the film back, they'd identify high value targets that she really needed a lot better resolution on. So Gambit's job was to go take uh, pictures of point targets. Uh, the only thing I'm allowed to say is that the resolution was better than two feet. Uh, that was kind of the ultimate Agena pointing and rate uh, control system. And uh, since we had the simulations and the geometry uh, part of the problem, we typically got tasked to do the end-to-end -end pointing and rate uh, and not just the control system piece. The, uh, one of the things to control the rate, the gambit system, uh, we had to roll the payload. And to avoid putting a uh, transient onto the control system, we had a uh, counter-rotating wheel that was calibrated to the payload. So that when we rotated it, we counter-rotated the wheel so that we got no net torque. 
what that did was to uh, avoid any transients once we got to the target point and transients translates into unwanted rates at the time. The second uh, crowning achievement for the attitude control group was one, one mission, it was just a uh, upper stage booster, we flew three of these, was we replaced all the analog uh, components with a gyro and accelerometer package and a digital computer. Uh, in that mission, the Agena was doing the navigation and guidance from the pad all the way up to orbit insertion of the payload. Uh, we had not done a digital system up until this time, so we had to scramble modifying our modeling tools to accommodate a combination digital and analog system. Uh, the buzzword there is Z-transforms for you control systems people. Uh, but we had to not only satisfy ourselves that we were stable, but satisfy our customer, of course. But in this case, we had to satisfy the booster contractor. They, they weren't used to getting guided by the second stage. So, but that worked real well. It was, it was a good technical interchange. Uh, then once, once the Agena era was over, we got into an advanced digital control system for a more agile spacecraft and longer life starting in the 1970s. Next chart. This is just, I think we've seen that before is the Gambit program. And uh, you can see the uh, engine in the background, in the rear, the 16,000 pound thrust engine, the two, two pressurized gas uh, bottles, the fuel tanks between the rings there, and then the front equipment section, and then what we call the roll joint, which had the counter rotating flywheel. The front part you see there is the uh, gambit payload. It has the line of sight, again, normal to the long axis. It's a much bigger lens. It's just, this was like a thir three foot diameter lens is, is a mirror as opposed to a lens to image the uh, image on the film. The film uh, system on the front end, just behind the, uh, the film buckets. Again, the, for sizing, you can see the, uh, the Agena is five feet in diameter. And again, since uh, the front end was all assembled by Kodak, uh, the main interface, we wanted to make sure that we had the inertia of the, of the payload balanced against our, our wheel we had. So every payload, uh, they outfitted a inertia simulator that they tested and they shipped that to Lockheed Sunnyvale that we would test our, our roll joint with. Next chart. As I mentioned, we, after Agena, we got into the advanced control system we wanted to get improved accuracy, uh, have greater maneuverability and longer lifetime. Uh, by the end of the Agena program, the typical lifetime was had, instead of days, had become weeks. We wanted to go to years. So we had that Agena digital control experience. We had the Agena precision pointing control legacy. Uh, instead of horizon sensors, we went to star trackers for uh, to replace horizon sensors. In those days, we didn't have CCDs, so we had to use photomultiplier tubes. Uh, and so we were inertially referenced. And to extend the lifetime, we used momentum devices for control, rotating wheels, rather than expendable control gas jets. So all of that experience, uh, we had developed that the flight computer we used was a uh, one megahertz computer with 24 kilobytes of uh, active memory. We had that computer developed and the uh, software in the computer. So between that experience, our pointing control experience and the fact that the Sunnyvale factory had capability for very large uh, spacecraft, that gave us a leg up to win the Hubble telescope in the, in the 80s. They had a key control requirement of 0 0.006 arc seconds pointing stability to a target star. That's not a reconnaissance satellite, but from a control system point of view, it used that legacy. And then of course, later in the 90s was the Iconos commercial imaging satellite. At that time, we could also do our onboard navigation since GPS was easily available and we had plenty of compute power. So Iconos by doing onboard navigation and precision pointing, you could actually make maps. So 
And of course, there are other military applications along the way. So next chart. Uh, with that, we had a, a long successful uh, history with the uh, attitude control system. And I had a lot of fun along the way. Uh, the next speaker, Terry Zaccone, will talk about details of the uh, horizon sensor. Well, hello. Thanks, Jim. That was really good. Now I know what we were doing. <laughs> um, <laughs> I came to Lockheed in 1961, uh, right after I graduated from Berkeley with a bachelor's in physics. Uh, and I kept going to school for my pretty much the next 20 years, uh, getting my master's in, in, in 70 and my PhD in 82. So when I got finished, the, the guys up in Palo Alto gave me a plaque, which I have on the window here, on the wall here, that says, how many years does it take an Italian to get a PhD? And on the back, it says 15 if he's gifted. So today, we'll talk about horizon sensors. Jim had mentioned that, the uh, part of the guidance system for the Agena. So next slide, please. So infrared horizon sensors. This is part of the Agena guidance system. What these did was they scanned the Earth CO2 horizon at 15.4 microns wavelength to provide local vertical information. The optics, including the bolometer detector, were germanium. Two sensors were used with the angle between the optical axes determined by orbit altitude. So next slide. So this is the same picture Jim used, but it shows where the, about the horizon sensor. In the lower right, you see the Agena, and then up here on the left part of the picture are all the other parts that are mounted on the Agena. And you see the horizon sensor with its angle looking down. It's, it's mounted in the belly of the Agena and looks down at the Earth. And I'll show you how that works into the control system. So next slide, please. So, so here's a, a kind of a picture of an Agena orbiting the Earth. And it's coming over the pole, coming toward us. And the two horizon sensors are looking out, looking downward, and they're scanning their little fields of view in a cone, both of them. And they're cutting, they're cutting cords out of the earth. Well, then the, the electronics the computer, that's the mixer box, takes those data and calculates the roll and the pitch angle. So that's how we get the guidance information from the horizon sensors. I'll, I'll go into more detail on that later. Next slide, please. So this is a photograph of what the sensors look like. The sensors are about five inches in diameter and about eight or nine inches long in the mixer box there. So there's two sensors. The one in the middle has been pulled apart so you can see the insides. And the, the front is a germanium window. Next slide, please. Ah, yes. Now here's the detail of one of the sensor heads. You see, you see on the left, the uh, mirrors that look down at an angle, they're canted down. And then if you go back to the right side, you see in yellow, the germanium barometer, that's the detector, okay? It looks through a lens. And so it, it projects a field of view, a little square field of view out of the sensor, and then it scans it in a cone. At the top of the picture, you'll see in, in black, you see the motor. That's a critical component because this has a rotating mirror. And that motor, you see it has a little spur gear and it rotates this whole front end. That motor has one inch ounce of torque. And it's a very critical part of this thing. I'll talk more about that later. Uh, next slide, please. So here's a, a satellite. Here's a description of how this really works. So let's say we're, we're going up toward the top of the picture and the satellite is no pitch, no roll. So the two cords that are scanned by the two sensors are gonna be the same length and they're gonna be parallel. Well, the, the mixer box can calculate all that. So it knows that we got zero pitch and roll here. Next slide. Now here's a case where the satellite rolled a little bit to the right, okay, right wing down, so to speak. Well, this is pretty logical that the, the cord that's scanned by the right sensor is gonna be a little longer because it's farther into the earth 
and the cord on the left it gets a little shorter because it's it's off the earth. It's going off the earth. And the box, the mixer box, calculates what that difference will be because it knows how big the earth is at that altitude. And it can calculate the roll angle. Next slide. Similarly with the with the pitch, let's say the nose is down. We're pitched down, but we're at zero roll. Well, a, a pitch down will will drive these fields of view toward the, toward the aft part of the of the path, and you see they cross the horizons, but the cords aren't going to be parallel. And our mixer box can figure that out. So that tells us that we have a nose down pitch, but we have zero roll. And that's essentially how the horizon sensor finds its data. Okay, next slide, please. So what are some of the challenges? Well, this is space. As, as, uh, as Miles mentioned, the challenges were enormous. Lots of stuff hadn't been worked out. Uh, the first, let's talk about the CO2 layer. The more I work on this talk, the more I I remember from what 60 years ago, right? And I'm even some, including some things I didn't know at the time. So I was calling a friend of mine in Texas who worked on this program with me in 1961. And uh, I was going to invite him to watch this presentation. And he emailed me back and said, Hey, I've got a paper that I've worked on that, that describes the, uh, it's, called, it's called the I rate report infrared atmospheric transmission evaluation. And we studied to see where's the best place to look to get data. And they discovered and proved that the best place was to look at the CO2 layer around the earth. So that's why, I never questioned why, I just used it. That's why we use a CO2 layer because we studied it and it avoids, uh, it avoids the problem of water vapor and clouds and it's uniform all around Earth. And so from then on, anytime anybody used horizon sensing, that's what they used. In fact, I went to work for another company briefly and uh, they too were making a horizon sensor that was for uh, the Gemini manned spacecraft, only it didn't have a conical scan. It, it kind of dithered uh, across the uh, horizon, but it too was sensing the horizon. And it too sensed the CO2 layer. So Lockheed set the pace for that. They kind of invented that and the paper shows it. So let's see, uh, let's talk about the motor. This motor is really, it's like a, it's like a watch. Uh, we, uh, <laughs> one inch ounce. And when you come to the quality control, how are you gonna test this thing, okay? So I remember distinctly big meeting back at Stamford, Connecticut, where they were making these things, where the sensors were being made. And we had a big meeting on the, on the motors. So we had the motor manufacturer in there and, and a bunch of people from Barnes Engineering and myself and two colonels from the Air Force. And so we've got the motor guy in there and we ask him, oh, in the middle of the table is a tray of these motors, good and bad. So we asked him, how do you know when it's a good motor that you're giving us. So how can you tell that, that the one you may have just made is good? And he says, well, I just, he picked one up and he held it up to his ear and he spun the, spun the shaft. And he says, I just listened to it and I can tell if it's good or bad. Picked up another one, he says, no, that one's no good. Picked up another one, yeah, yeah, that's good. <laughs> and I'll never forget this picture of two Air Force colonels holding these little motors up to their ears with their faces all screwed up and spinning the shafts and trying to hear something. And, and of course they didn't. So we, we left them alone and went on to something else that we could test. So um, that, was, that was one of the, one of the things that Lockheed uh, saw. The other one was the, the uh, lube, or the Mahadia lubricate a moving part in space. Well, the first thing we tried, of course, was graphite because we knew oils in Greece would evaporate. But it turns out that the slipperiness you feel from graphite comes from tiny molecules of water entrained between the flakes of, of graphite. 
And when it goes in space, of course, that evaporates and you end up with carborundum, which you can imagine what that does to berry. So we ended up using molybdenum disulfide for the, uh, for the lube for these things. So let's see, um, the, the tensor delivery, I put that up there because these are secret pieces of equipment. They come in a, they come in a little case that about the size of a, of a cosmetics case with a little handle on it and it's secret. So you can imagine all the rigmarole involved in carrying one of these things from coast to coast. I delivered several of them both ways and it was really a big deal. Uh, so in summary, next slide. Lockheed solved many new spacecraft challenges as Miles mentioned during, during the Sagita program. The horizon sensor durability and accuracy were steadily improved over 397 missions from 1959 to 1984 uh, and I've just described a few of the things that, that we encountered and solved, and now everybody knows. So uh, let me turn it over now to uh, Hugh Satterley, who will talk about thermodynamics. Thank you. I'm Hugh Satterley. I came to Lockheed in November 1958 in the U.S. Navy. Before that, I received my training in mechanical engineering at Stanford University. After spending about half of my 36 year career- You please turn on your camera. Oops, sorry. After spending about half my 36 year career in thermodynamics, I moved to work on a major program in the series of Lockheed reconnaissance programs. The work was always close to or at the cutting edge. It was always fascinating and enjoyable. Engineers designing temperature control of a genus spacecraft and its equipment were among the first to confront environments very different from those encountered in aircraft or other earthbound situations. Next slide. How different was this new challenge? The structure was no longer affected by skin friction because there was no air. There was, was a need for lighter structures which required the use of unusual alloys. Surface materials were no longer protected by a thick atmosphere but were degraded by high levels of ultraviolet and ionizing radiation from the sun. Next slide. This table compares uh, heat transfer uh, mechanisms, uh, conventional ones on the surface of the earth or an aircraft to those in space. On the earth, force convection and conduction are the major Heat transfer mechanisms, natural convection and radiation are considered in most applications to be uh, very weak and are often just neglected. But in space on the right, uh, radiation is all important in determ determining the temperature of the satellite and conduction is just about the, the only way of getting heat from one place to another. Of course, convection during ascent is uh, important and uh, the high speed of, of uh, travel through the atmosphere resulted in, in, uh, in high temperatures, sometimes to the point of failure of some of the structural materials. So uh, odd alloys such as magthorium were employed because that alloy retained good strength at elevated temperatures. Next slide. Shown here are a typical Agena reconnaissance vehicle and one of the Soviet spy satellites. The Soviet unit is larger and heavier, reflecting their design strategy of building an earthbound environment into their design. It costs them a lot of weight. 
theirs is a heavy sealed pressure vessel that holds a helpful nitrogen uh, atmosphere, enabling the use of cooling fans to spread heat from components to the skin at a weight cost, of course. By contrast, the Agena is unsealed and contains no atmosphere to aid cooling. The heat transfer design approach is to use to the limit the weak heat transfer mechanisms remaining. For both of these satellites though, external services must be treated to meter the solar input and to manage the radiant heat output. Next slide. The heat transfer phases, uh, of course, are ascent, orbital, and reentry. Ascent and reentry uh, uh, analysis of those utilized experience from other missile and space programs uh, tailored to our needs on the Agena mission. For the orbiting uh, mission, though, orbit mission, uh, conduction and radiation only with no convection. Next slide. This, we have the fortune to have uh, at least one picture of an Agena uh, in orbit. I uh, had none of the very early ones, of course, no selfies allowed. Uh, this photo is of the NASA target Agena and it will illustrate the, uh, how the Agena exchanges energy with its environment. Uh, the sun is above to one side, leaving a shadow on the near side. Think of the sun as being a very bright light bulb with a high color temperature of 6,000 Kelvin. Reflected solar from the earth, you can see the earth illuminated by the sun here. Uh, reflected solar from the earth's surface, uh, also called the albedo, uh, illuminates the bottom side. The bottom also receives uh, IR radiated from the earth. It has the same geometry as the albedo, uh, but the color temperature is now near room temperature at 300 Kelvin. And it's invisible infrared radiation, uh, invisible to the, to, the, to the human eye. And lastly, the Agena radiates to the surroundings from all its surfaces also at roughly room temperature. The sunlight and the albedo change with time as the Agena orbits from the sunny side of the earth to the dark side. Earthshine and outward radiation remain constant. Next slide. The earth's thick atmosphere protects us and our things here on earth from damage by unfiltered solar radiation. Damaging energy is mostly filtered out. Development of a white paint which would stay white was pursued by the Lockheed Research Labs with success and where they developed a, a paint with a, a, on a contract which was used by all of our uh, space programs from then on. In developing these, they had to purify the, uh, uh, the pigment for the paint, the white pigment, usually titanium dioxide, get all the extraneous material out of it, which would turn brown when in the sunlight in a space. At any rate, that together with uh, a high, uh, a, a vehicle, a liquid, which is resistant to uh, change by unf unfiltered sunlight, uh, produced a, a paint which is very useful. For the future, uh, as time went on, some spacecraft needed absorptivities, which are even lower, and uh, solar absorptivities. And uh, this led to the development of of paints using the same pigments, but in a, a very fragile silicate binder. These were mechanically fragile, expensive to make and apply, 
and required protection during the factory environment. Multi-layer foil blankets were employed where thermal isolation was paramount. These were used especially in cryogenic payloads, enabling the use of very sensitive low noise electronics. Some of the programs uh, had uh, very large components. Uh, uh, one example would be uh, the very large batteries, which in operation during charge and discharge produced a lot of heat, but, and conduction was in, uh, wasn't enough to get the heat to the skin. So we developed and employed heat pipes uh, so that we could cool these big batteries. Inside the spacecraft, uh, there was developed an uh, analog network. Uh, the uh, analysis involved dividing the skin and structure into small elements with thermal capacity and connecting them with, with uh, conduction, uh, thermal conduction with the simulator resistors and radiation resistors. The conduction network had to be paralleled by an intricate and very complex radiation uh, resistance network connecting any two services which could see each other. It's a formidable geometrical problem. This network was driven by heat inputs from internal equipment in accordance with mission duty cycles and the external solar and other inputs in accord with the orbit mission. Next slide. Testing was crucial uh, to uh, success in our programs. And uh, we used the thermal vacuum uh, test not only to um, uh, test the models, but to uh, check out the equipment in its operation. Thermal vacuum testing occurred in large vacuum chambers equipped with a cold wall, a nitrogen cooled cold wall to absorb radiating heat and IR lamps to heat the outer skin so that the internal heat flow could be compared to model predictions. These tests, importantly, also provided the opportunity to vigorously challenge the operation of all equipment to operate together successfully at low and high temperatures. Next slide. Lockheed successfully developed thermal designs for earlier and later Agenas and other spacecraft. Development of needed surface coatings and other means of thermal control were carried out as needed. Now, I've given a very brief introduction to how uh, thermal design was accomplished at Lockheed. Uh, and Sam Reckie is now going to summarize what we've covered this afternoon. Thank you, Hugh. I uh, would like to uh, close with uh, a few charts. First, uh, going over. Next chart, please. As you heard quite a bit about the Agena today, and I thought I'd um, summarize uh, what Agena accomplished mission-wise uh, over the period from about 1960 to the 1987 period. Uh, the uh, most important was the Corona Agena missions, NRO, and there are some other NRO programs that are still classified. So a large portion of the Agena uh, was tied to the NRO. Also, uh, we had a large number of NASA missions. Uh, they, uh, NASA decided to use the Agena sort of as a space truck 
to carry payloads to the moon, Ranger mission, to Venus, which was also a Mariner mission, and to Mars, the Mariner mission. The other important mission that a gene accomplished is rendezvous and docking. And this was on the Gemini uh, manned um, flights to prove for later flight how to dock with uh, the space station. The last one is uh, a, a lot of you probably never knew that we flew the first nuclear powered system uh, in, with the Agena. And uh, as you know, with all of the fear factors with nuclear power, uh, this system was never fully developed for use. Next chart, please. I'd like to summarize Lockheed's uh, reconnaissance satellite program from 1956 to 1995. And um, basically what I wanna convey to you is the following. The Corona mission was so successful, even though by today's standard, we only reach 70% reliability in 19 days in orbit. And, and from the point of view of that time period, considering that we started with no knowledge of space, uh, that was really an accomplishment. And um, Dr. Land, uh, basically uh, midway through the Corona program, uh, told President Eisenhower that if we're going to win, we've got to see it well, see it all, and see it now. And basically, the programs to do this was started in a very orderly fashion, using the same management technique that uh, Skunk Works perfected. Uh, we perfected on, on Corona, and then we carried it on on each of these programs. There's, some, there's one important fact that I'd like to convey on each of these bars. Corona, we reached recovery in 24 months to get to KH4 configuration with two RVs. It took us five years. When we bid and won Gambit 3, uh, we decided that we're gonna do this in two years. And so can you imagine taking the Agena, totally modifying it as Jim indicated to you, putting a roll joint on, putting a new camera on, two RVs, and go through all the development, fly it in 24 months, it, with basically 100% mission success. Hexagon was uh, even more complicated because we had to go to a, a bigger booster, Titan 3D. We had never flown that before. It was a 30,000 pound satellite, 10 foot diameter. We had to develop all new tooling all new test equipment. We had to build a factory for the first time. Lockheed invested $17 million. In those days, $17 million was a lot of money to build a facility 
which still stands today as one of the best factories for processing a satellite. And with that, we won the program and uh, the Hexagon program flew for 19 flights and the maximum duration flight was 200, 270 days. And by the way, Gambit 3 flew over 100 days on many, many missions. So you can see from 19 days on Corona, Gamut went over 100 days, Hexagon went 270 days. Also, Hexagon, we were challenged to basically fly Hexagon in 36 months. We missed that window a little bit and actually took us 41, 41 months. Kennan was also challenged to fly a, from a film system to an electrical optical system, and we met it in 60 months. So I want to go over this with you in terms of what, what is what set of rules or tenets or processes that really made this thing so successful. Next chart, please. Next chart, please. Uh, Corona had two people that were really the key people that made Corona successful and also guided Lockheed and the NRO over the early years. Uh, one is uh, Bill Bessel and the other one is Jim Plummer. Uh, Jim Plummer was, was rated as the Kelly Johnson of LMSC. And he um, was asked by the government people to come and serve as the DNRO. And he reluctantly left Lockheed to do that and served uh, during 1973 and 1976 period. Came back to Lockheed, um, became uh, assistant uh, executive or executive vice president of LMSC, and then also went on to be the chairman of Aerospace Corporation. Next chart, please. The declassification ceremony for Corona was held in 1995. Basically, uh, if you think about it, this is like 50 years after everything was accomplished. Unfortunately, a, a large number of some of the people had passed away, but this is the membership of government and contractors. All the contractors and all the government people that participated in the Corona program assembled for the ceremony. Next chart, please. Uh, Jim has already gone over this, uh, so I will go to the next chart. What I want to indicate to you on this Gamut 3 chart is the customer, because the, there was so much modifications to the Agena, he, he chose a new name called Satellite Controls Section, which got used in the future uh, in this way. But let me give you the highlights. There was not only the roll joint, but we put on the secondary propulsion system that um, obtained the propellants from the main tank. And the way uh, Bob Powell and Pete Ragusa were the two people that really ran this program they created a trajectory 
that flew as low as possible to burn out. And the whole key was to save, uh, to get as much performance out of the Titan 3B so there'll be as much propellant left over in the tank and then use that for orbit adjust. And the reason for this is because in order to get high resolution, one of the parameters was fly lower. So hexagon, uh, Gambit actually flew uh, between 60 and 70 miles in a fairly heavy drag environment. The, um, so basically also, uh, uh, Jim indicated to you, the whole guidance system on this was totally modified. And one of the features that uh, was introduced by Pete Ragusa was these, uh, what he called adaptive bias, which when you torque, turn the um, fly, flywheel, the roll joint to the target area and settled it at that angle. He then turned off the, the attitude control jets so that you drifted over the target area and to a photograph at, at, the, at the highest resolution possible. Uh, the, the, low, the high end resolution of, of Gambit is still very, very classified. Next chart, please. This is the hexagon program satellite shown in the ceremony at the Smithsonian. And uh, what is missing here is the mapping camera at the very front on the left. Uh, the map, we never had them. We never could find a, a mapping camera to put on for the ceremony. This satellite was a qualification model. Uh, it was stored in Vandenberg in a, in, a, uh, in, a, in a warehouse that was temperature controlled. So this, this is still a very good satellite sitting here. And the, uh, the to the left is where all the RVs were packaged. In the middle is the midsection that housed the cameras. And uh, the, uh, the to the back is the aft section where we had all of the satellite control section equipment mounted. And, and the, we had a hydrazine um, motor for orbit adjust, monopropellant, and hydrazine attitude control jets as well. Next chart, please. This gives you a feel for some of the parameters comparis comparing Titan 3D and Thorad configurations. And as you can see, the uh, between the, the fact that this was 10 feet in diameter versus five feet, the, uh, we carried 2,000 pounds of film compared to 80 pounds of film. The, uh, we also had four large 500 pound film load RVs compared to 80 pound film load RVs. So these basically, if you look at it in general terms, it was an order of magnitude, more capability in order of magnitude in complexity. Next chart, please. Miles Johnson talked a lot about the factor of the pad. We took what Miles talked about on Corona, what Miles and the team developed, and we took it one generation or to the next level of generation. And when we decided that the corporation had to build a brand new factory and the brand new factory that 
the heart of the Benton factory was to basically house all of the test programs that were necessary. We tested everything at the module level and you could see the module level to the left in, in the upper portion of the uh, flow chart. We stacked the satellite in a vertical uh, stand and we basically uh, ran a, um, an acoustic test. So between an ambient test, we ran an acoustic test and, uh, and, and, and then the uh, collimation test, a thermal vacuum test, another ambient test and a launch base test to get ready for ship. We, our whole goal here was to make sure that everything was totally tested. Any discrepancies were totally worked off. We basically sent a satellite with zero discrepancy. And we had the customer on site, all of the associate contractors from McDonnell Douglas, uh, Perkin Elmer, uh, the iTech uh, crew from for the mapping camera. So every contractor basically lived with us to process this through the factory, ship ship everything to the base with zero discrepancy. We never had any any problems at the launch base. Every satellite launch went perfectly. And, uh, and also, since the customer was living, two, our two customers, uh, CIA and the Air Force, were living with us in the factory. We, we went through a buy-off after each test. We went through and worked off all the discrepancies closed it all out and had the customer sign off on each test. So that when we went to the launch readiness test uh, at Vandenberg, there was zero discrepancy. So this is the process. And as, if you see at the bottom there, a trailer, uh, that was the, we built that trailer to house the entire complete satellite. Uh, it was 70 feet long. And uh, we had to measure every underpass from Sunnyvale to Vandenberg. And we built that trailer. Uh, and uh, I think it's still in new ship. And of course, to the right is the launch pad and the Titan 3D launch. Next chart, please. The Corona program, I mean, the Kennan program, uh, I really can't reveal too much about the program, but what I want to reveal is that President Nixon authorized the program in 1971. Uh, Dr. Edmund Lamb told the president that this was a quantum jump an unquestionable technical lead for the United States. And President Nixon challenged NRO and the contractors to launch this in 1976. So Lockheed and the NRO launched the satellite and the relays in January 1977. And the first flight was uh, totally operational, very successful. Next chart. In order to take advantage of this near real time system, we had to develop a digital 
imagery workstation. The amount of film that we had to process and with zoom capability with shade removal, contrast, brightness, manipulations. There was nothing in the market that can do this. As a matter of fact, in order to design this workstation, we ganged 20 sun workstations, tied it up to with uh, fiber optics, and basically simulated this, this uh, IDEX station. And that's how we basically engineered it. And we had, we built a, uh, we, we had 27 custom chips that we built in the foundry, 11 layer board. And we just, we had, we built a pick and place machine that we got the design from Sun, uh, from, uh, from, um, Apple at that time, Steve Jobs allowed us to do that. And that was built in the Sunnyvale facility. And we produced a hundred uh, units and uh, really worked out well. So it got us into a situation where now you can put these workstations oversee at intelligence centers and at uh, at DOD uh, command centers so that we can basically have a system now in which you can implement the sensor to shooter experiment that we successfully accomplished in the first Gulf War. Next chart, please. At the bottom, you'll see the uh, the uh, label down there that says uh, Presidential Directive Commercial One Meter Satellite. So when the Cold War ended, uh, we got an approval from President Clinton to give us a license to build a one meter satellite for all commercial use and for government use both ways. And, uh, and then uh, we decided to form a company, a, a separate company called Space Imaging, which was a partnership company between Lockheed and E-Systems, which became Raytheon and we had to get it financed through a, uh, just like a venture capital fund financing. And uh, with that success we put together, uh, we uh, formed a company in, 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 uh, in the Denver area and uh, also uh, created a, um, basically a license to other countries so that we can set up ground stations from which you command the satellite and bring down the data, process it. And we formed one of the all these ventures in, um, in Japan, in UAE and in Europe. And then we built the satellite, launched in 1999. Next chart, please. And this is a this is the chart that we built, and launched in 1999. Uh, you see the Lockheed Martin label on here because this was flown after the merger. And uh, you see some of the characteristics. This was an 1800 pound satellite. By today's, uh, this was the, I call it the start of the small sat movement. Next chart, please. 
I want to sort of summarize at, to uh, basically present what we call the seven tenets. These are the seven tenets that made every one of these program successful. Uh, developed very fast, but so because in today's standard, uh, nobody does this except for companies like SpaceX. But the current government process is totally broken. And the way it's broken today is because we don't have a threat-based need statement. The threat-based statement is just like market. It's like, what is the market need? What does the threat need to overcome the threat? The third is, the second is third sharp, short timelines. Uh, when, when you see what happened with the 30, F-35 program, where it took 20 years to get to an operational state. I mean, it, that's because there was not a demand to do this in five years. Uh, by the way, the F-117, the Skunk Works then, was done in five years. And the other one is stable funding. So th those three are broken today in the government and we're working and, and we put this together be because we wanted to go back to the government and say, you gotta bring this back. Next chart, please. I wanna close with this chart. It's the Corona business practices that was put together by the Jeremiah panel in 1996. Uh, Jeremiah panel was, was put together by the NRO because the Cold War ended and they realized that the mission for, for the NRO had to be changed. And so they went into a mission analysis to determine how to restructure the program. And they also recognize that in the peacetime mode, they will be losing a lot of the features of what NRO did to make them great. So they took the time to analyze the other programs, Manhattan program, the Polaris, and the F-117 and, and compared it to Corona and, and uh, came to the conclusion that the Corona, Manhattan Project, Polaris, and F-117, all, all in the same class. So I wanted to end with this because again, Corona was a huge, huge success. So with that, I'm going to turn this back to Tom. And uh, Jeff or Cliff, who's going to ask the first question? Well, I can go ahead. This is Jeff. Um, I sent a list around a little bit ago. One question that came up a couple of times effectively was, and this is probably for Sam Iraqi, when did the Soviets learn about our satellite reconnaissance capability? And when did they build their own? And how and when did we learn about their Zenit abilities? We uh, learned about the Zenith after the Corps ended. Uh, we had a period in which uh, we exchanged visits uh, I didn't go, but I mean, we had a team from the U.S. visit uh, at that time, now Russia, and um, had some sessions with them to uh, learn about their program, uh, 
uh, in, in, in ours. Uh, as you know, uh, or maybe some of you would know, we were encouraged to form a partnership with the Proton Booster. Uh, Bill Perry is the one that encouraged us to do that. And we formed a partnership with Khrunichev. Uh, Khrunichev was a factory that was uh, president of, of the company. And he was also the mayor of, of, the, of, the, of the city called Khrunichev. And so we had a very successful uh, business in which we flew Western satellites on top of, of the Proton and um, ran that business until Putin came into power and, and uh, John McMahon was the one that advised us to sell the business, so we did. Hmm. Okay. Uh, okay, there were a number of questions on uh, the camera, which is probably for Bill. Uh, one had to do with smearing of uh, the ground track Another was, did the camera start recording on the first orbit? Um, did we ever drop to a low orbit to get better resolution? Was there an equivalent shutter time? I guess I'm asking these all together. Um, and there's one more here. What were the key innovations in optical design over time that allowed for this kind of resolution? Cliff, that's a lot of memory for Bill. Why don't you ask him one at a time? All right, we'll go with uh, smearing. How did we deal with smearing? Bill, turn on your mic. There was image motion compensation built in with some cams and rocking of the, uh, of the two cameras from the Delta structure to take into account image motion compensation. Um, there was no particular shutter time because the, um, the painting of the uh, image onto the film was the result of the of the time that the lens was actually exposing the camera at the at the level of the field flattener. So it was a time thing, not a particular shutter speed. And hit me with another question. There was another question about uh, when did the camera start recording? Was it on the first orbit or later? Um, I. I don't know specifically the answer to that question. It, it would actually be a function of when was the orbit such that it was over uh, an area of interest that you would want to see. So that was dictated by uh, um, by where you actually were when you got into orbit and the launch window and all the rest. But chances are it was pretty early in the mission. We have, uh, let's see, another one for you. I'm scrolling here. I think oh, Jeff uh, asking you next one. Okay. Okay. I, um, this is probably from Miles. Um, Miles, we got a couple of questions uh, that effectively were how long did integration take before launch? And when we integrated things, were we essentially plucking things off of our shelf that we had built up for this for each mission? one after the other, or was each set of things basically mission bespoke for that particular mission? I guess, in, in other words, uh, were they kind of interchangeable parts or did we have to build the parts fresh for each new launch? Are you talking about the the pad itself, or are you talking about the spacecraft and, and booster combination? I think we're basically talking about integration of the satellite together with the booster. I'm, 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 not, sh I'm not clear on what the question is, but I, I, can, I can sort of give you the perspective I have concerning how things worked. Um, there was a before and after. There was before system engineering and after, and before uh, the circumstances were that when the 
Corona Agena and Corona payload arrived at Vandenberg Air Force Base. It was as if those devices had never been tested by the factory. The launch base felt obligated, and I was one of those people at the launch base to retest everything, in which case we would remove subsystems from their their container from the um, from the uh, uh, from the Agena. We would remove devices from the payload, and we would retest. And should there be a problem? we would replace it with kind as shipped from the factory because Vandenberg didn't have a, they didn't have a supply. Yeah. They were, they were just a, a service. The, the length of time was that the, the Corona payload and the Corona Gina would spend, would spend approximately one week in the missile assembly buildings, their respective missile assembly buildings before migrating to the pad at which once it was at the pad, you were dealing with a multicultural, having booster payload and Agena personnel working together. That period would be somewhere in the neighborhood of five to seven days. So the general duration of test and integration, if that's what you want to call it, would be something in the order of two weeks. Thank you. Well, and let me, let me just add to that. Since, since at the height of the program, we were launching every, every three weeks, there wasn't much more time than Miles just uh, enumerated. Right. Thanks. Okay, Here's, uh, Jim, you volunteered to answer this question. And the question was, what were the key innovations in optical design over time that allowed for the resolution across the field of view? Um. Well, the big change was between the early Corona, which had a fairly small lens, to the Gambit, which had a 36 inch diameter uh, aperture. Uh, the, uh, that gives you a much smaller diffraction spot size. Uh, the second innovation, of course, was to the uh, grain size in the film over time got better and better. Uh, the third thing is we were able to control the spacecraft rates uh, better and better. So it's the combination of those were the three main things that get into the resolution. There was a related question and that was, did the Agena ever drop to a low orbit where there were thermal issues, uh, but that was done to improve resolution? I, I can take that one. The, the, um, yeah, they did lower the orbit to um, as low as 80 nautical miles where the, you would get into some uh, potentially some amount of aerodynamic heating, but it, mostly it was a matter of uh, atmospheric drag and, and how much coal gas you had or how much you, know, you were able to make up the orbit. So the, pretty much the, 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 it was not a thermal issue as much as it was a drag issue. Um, and I, I recall about 80 nautical miles was as low as we flew in from an elliptical orbit with an apogee you know, around 200 nautical miles. Your turn, Jeff. <laughs> um, why don't you uh, continue, uh, um, Cliff? I've got a, uh, I'm, I'm looking up my list here. Okay, well, there was a question as to how long a specific vehicle would last before all the film was expended. And, um, oh, uh, that needs a verbal answer here. Yeah, in fact, it was a 19 day mission. Um, and for the, this was at the, at the, at the end of the Corona mission, KH-4B, uh, 32,000 feet of film, and it was all taken up, you know, finally by the second bucket at the end of 19 days. I think okay. I have a question for Terry. Uh, how does the mixer box know about the parallel scan? How does what? The mixer box. I think that's the box that takes the two horizon sensors, if I got yeah. it right. How does, how, it does know? It, how does it know? Well, it's About the parallel the scan. The parallel scan? Yeah. What do you mean by parallel scan? I think the parallel lines. Yes, yes. Well, it, it's calculating from the crossing points across the horizon from the two sides. 
and it That's knows how the how big the earth is the circle of the earth so it can calculate the chord and then from that it can calculate whether or not they're parallel or you know canada to one side or the other is that a digital computation or an analog computer no it has to be an analog okay. jeff cliff Oh, yeah. Okay. There were a couple personal things. Uh, one was from somebody named Anonymous who wanted to mention that his mom worked on uh, image interpretation for the uh, Corona program. Never told me his name and I, I never heard about his mother, but uh, he just volunteered that. Uh, there's something from Ed Burnett who wishes his father, Walt Burnett, could have uh, heard this. This was addressed to the I'd like to uh, I'd like to see something on that. It turns out uh, I worked with Walt Burnett. Uh, yeah, Walt Burnett was an outstanding, outstanding guidance and control engineer, test engineer at Vandenberg Air Force Base, and he uh, he he basically uh, took me under his wing and taught me what he knew. Uh, and uh, I, uh, when I joined the guidance and control test engineering component at Vandenberg Air Force Base. He, he was a, de a desk next to me. Uh, there was another man by the name of Don Hilliard who uh, equally uh, was an outstanding guidance and control engineer. I, uh, I left that department and became a launch and test engineer, a test and launch and conductor. So I, I departed from there after about a year and a half, but uh, I'll always remember Walt and be forever grateful to what he did to teach me what he knew and and emulate his uh, his professional manner. Okay, there's another one from uh, Dick Priest, uh, and he wants to know what. Uh, apparently, he owes Sam a, a factory to pad document. It sounds <laughs> like he never finished it, <laughs> but he wanted to say hello. So uh, there's that. Hey, see hello to Dick also for me. Okay, uh, I'm sure he's listening. Well, he did a great job for us on Hexagon. I think there's a question uh, for Bill. Uh, was there any special efforts to protect the film from harsh conditions of space and radiation? I, I don't think, well, the film was always inside the, the physical structure of the spacecraft. Um, and so if there were special efforts made, it was probably to keep it dark inside as much as it was from, uh, from radiation or, uh, or any of the other effects. Um, so I, I don't, I'm not aware of any other specific uh, efforts that were made. There's a question for Sam here. Um, somebody, I forget who, wants to know how the Agena became the docking target for the Gemini program. Uh, no, I don't know the background on that. Uh, I do know that, um, at that time, uh, Agena was uh, probably the only three-axis vehicle that had a lot of experience. And uh, in order to prove rendezvous and docking, you really need a versatile three-axis satellite. So I think that's how I think the Agena got chosen. I don't think there was anything else on the market at that time that can do that kind of uh, rendezvous and docking kind of uh, experiment. The relationship may have started with the Ranger program, which was a, uh, a booster for a moon mission. And that may have opened the door with NASA. Yeah. Well, we flew not only Ranger, but all the Mariner flights as well, so. We so, had a question. So who can tell us, uh, where did the name Corona come from? Who, who, who baptized the program with the name Corona? <laughs> I'll, I'll, take, I'll take that one. In the know. office uh, in Washington, when they first uh, devised the program, they said, we have to give it a name and uh, one of the guys looked around the office, he saw a, a Corona, Smith Corona or a Corona typewriter, and he said, we'll call it Corona. 
and and it, it was a, a, a kind of a foreshadowing thing because they did we did experience problems with corona discharge a whole different phenomena than typewriters later in the program but the name came from the typewriter well i have a, i have another version <laughs> <laughs> let's hear it um, bill um, bill um, bill bessel smoked cigars and he smoked corona cigars and that's how the word, that's how the corona name came into being so i'll have to put a cigar in our opening presentation if we ever do this again <laughs> okay uh, we it's also funny. got a question 60 years later we're conflicting with the uh, epidemic called corona what what a what a interesting phenomena yeah absolutely uh Somebody has a first cousin named Floyd Kesser, who's 97 years old, and he wonders if any of you guys knew him, know him. What was the name again? Floyd Kesser, K-E-S-S-E-R. I, I remember the name, but I can't, I can't associate it with, um, okay. with anything relevant right now that I'm, I'm... Did he work at Vandenberg? Don't know. It's just a, a text message. Okay. Sorry. Oh. Okay, there was a, another good question. I sort of lost track of. Somebody wanted to know if any of the local labs in the Sunnyvale area, such as EDL, played any part in these programs. Which, uh, which, pro which company? Well, that that was a for instance. EDL, I think the uh, Electronic Design Lab, something like that. I, I don't remember when they came to be, but that was the question that was asked. What local uh, labs took place in the program? Oh, we had a lot of labs in in this area that participated. Okay. And a lot of machine shops too. Does that include the lab in the garage in, in uh, Los Gatos? Yeah, I mean, the lab in the garage. <laughs> there you go. Okay, I think we're pretty much at the end of the questions. Uh, any last minute comments anybody wants to make? Uh, I'm gonna put up the reference slide. Give me a second. Let me get it properly positioned. Okay, so um, thank like the, from the IEEE, I'd like to thank the panelists for all the time and effort they put into this presentation. Um, all of you attendees, uh, anybody who registered will get an email from us with a list of a bunch of links, including these resources uh, that were used to uh, uh, develop a lot of the presentation. But most of it, the interesting stuff came from the uh, six panelists and their buddies who uh, helped the IEEE put this presentation together. So uh, if, uh, if you six panelists have any last minute comments, uh, please uh, one at a time do it and then we will end the, we will end the, uh, the webinar, webinar for all. Anybody have any comments to add? It worked real good. Thanks for listening. <laughs> Is that a, that's a famous quote, right? Exactly. Okay, so at this point, I think I'm going to end the, if I can figure out how to do it, uh, I will. Thank you, Tom. Oh, thank Thanks you. Thank you, Tom. Good job. It's been Good fun. Job. And yes. Thank you. Uh,